Hello, everyone. My name is Sergey, and I'm a group product manager at Percona. I'm excited to have you here today at Percona Live, and I'm going to talk about cross-cloud migrations with databases on Kubernetes. So what are you going to learn today from this talk is how we at Percona uh, designed our Kubernetes operators so they can help you with migrating your databases from one cloud to another or from on-prem to the cloud using Kubernetes operators. This should be quite interesting and awesome. This is a quick uh, agenda. So we briefly going to look at how databases on Kubernetes look like, what is operators, how they work. Then we're gonna jump into the multi-cloud and hybrid cloud stories. We're gonna look into how Kubernetes helps there, how we designed our operators, uh, what kind of techniques we're using. There will be brief examples from our operators uh, YAML manifests and how you can configure it. And then we're gonna quickly go through a demo. I have a demo for migrating your MongoDB from EC2 or DigitalOcean machine to Kubernetes uh, with our operator, obviously. So let's begin. Kubernetes and uh, operators. So when we talk about databases on Kubernetes, what you need to know is that there are two components. First one is Kubernetes primitives. It is everything that you need to create on Kubernetes to run your application or to run your database. It is uh, pods, stateful sets, storage, PVCs, uh, service accounts, everything, right? And you need to define them in uh, manifest. You need to carefully understand how to configure them all and so on. So you need to know Kubernetes uh, pretty well to, to configure it all. And uh, the second piece is configuration. Uh, for databases, it means that if you want to run a cluster, you need to ensure that all the nodes are configured properly so that they uh, talk to each other. For example, in MongoDB world, you need to ensure that you have uh, the same certificates so that the MongoDB nodes can talk to each other within the same replica set. You need to ensure that you specify the correct IP addresses, ports, and many, many, many more, right? And uh, doing all this manually is not an easy task. It would require you to learn all these things, understand how they work, and uh, also maintain all of this, right? And uh, this is where operators uh, are going to help you a lot. And uh, what operators do, they allow you to obfuscate or masquerade all this Kubernetes primitives and database configuration. Instead of it, you talk directly to the Kubernetes API and you specify what kind of database you want to get, what kind of network do you want to use, how you want to expose your database, in other words, how you want to configure your backups, how you want uh, to configure your database in, in, in a way like configuration file for the database and, and so on. And uh, you just specify this big uh, YAML manifest, you ship it to Kubernetes and operator does all the heavy lifting. It provisions the Kubernetes primitives, it configures the database and what you get as a result, you get a service. You get an IP address or the endpoint that you or your application or your developers can connect to and utilize this database at full and it is production grade and it is backed up by uh, expertise of the people who develop these operators in case of Procorna by our expertise. And um, what I really love uh, about operators that it's not only a way to deploy your databases, but it's also a way to manage them. You can take the backup, for example, and upload it to S3 compatible storage. Uh, you can create uh, a scheduled backup uh, so that operator is going to automatically upload the backups and uh, apply the necessary retention policy to it. Uh, you can scale your database through the operator. You don't need to go into the uh, container and uh, reconfigure it in any way. You can uh, upgrade your operator uh, and your database through the operator, uh, which is awesome. So there's lots of maintenance tasks that you execute manually or with some custom scripts that operator can execute for you now. 
So instead of figuring out how to do that, you can talk to Kubernetes API and uh, let operator do everything. Okay. And um, uh, if we talk about operators basics uh, for the ones who don't know how it works, there are two components. First one is uh, the pod with uh, operator container inside of it uh, that has some logic, some code, and uh, the custom resource definition. Custom resource definition is just a way to expand Kubernetes API. So Kubernetes API has various resources that you can manage and create like a pod. Uh, but once you create a custom resource definition, then you can expand this API and create MongoDB cluster, for example, uh, through the Kubernetes API. And that's what custom resource definition does. And then what is happening, the user or the application or some CI CD pipeline creates a custom resource, which is which uh, is a YAML manifest defining how your database should look like. And operator sees that new custom resource created or custom resource was modified and executes the code logic uh, that it has in, in, inside of it. And as a result, you get a database service or any other application. Uh, if we talk about Procon operators, there are three production grade operators that we have for MySQL, for MongoDB and Postgres. They are 100% open source. Uh, so we don't have any open core licenses or anything like that. All the features and our operators are really feature rich. Uh, uh, they are available 100% uh, for free. So you, uh, and they are Apache licensed. So you can download them from GitHub and utilize the way you want. And the last point here, number four, is supported by Percona. This means that uh, you can have a contract with Percona and we're going to support your databases running in Kubernetes with our uh, operators. And obviously, if you don't have a contract, you can always uh, submit a ticket for us or contact us through the forum and the other someone from the community or our developers and engineers are going to help you with uh, questions that you have for our operators. There is a link down there where you can read more about Percona operators. Go ahead. I encourage you to try them out. Now, jumping to the today's topic about multi and uh, hybrid cloud. Um, let's go. So first of all, we need to understand what's, what is the problem. Uh, and uh, there are a few. Uh, maybe there are more, and I guess there are more, but uh, I, what I see that these three are the top ones. So first one is vendor cloud lock-in. Lots of businesses, they do not want to uh, be locked in within a single cloud or within a single vendor. And what they want to do is they want to have the infrastructure and the applications ready to be easily moved or restored on any other environment. And uh, this is the big problem actually nowadays. And uh, it's again, it, it is not only about your infra, uh, it's also about your application readiness because in your application, you can use some uh, custom uh, services that one cloud provides, but once you want to move the, your application to another cloud, you will need to do the full architecture or recode everything, which is daunting and uh, uh, would would cost you a lot. Uh, another problem, obviously, is uh, migrations. So if you are running in one cloud, your company strategy changes and uh, you, you need to move to another cloud for various reasons, whether it's cost or it's just the strategy, uh, you need to be ready for that. And uh, the last but not least, disaster recovery is usually when you run again in one cloud or on-prem, you need to be sure that you can quickly recover your application and your business operations in another data center or in another cloud. Uh, and uh, it, it, it is all applicable for not only for applications, but obviously for 
um, databases. So these are, I believe, the three uh, biggest risks and problems that multi-cloud helps you to address. And the, if we talk about databases, um, it's pretty simple. Uh, for disaster recovery, it can be um, backup and restore, but it takes a lot of time. So usually for disaster recovery, you would also use something like a replication. So you have a data center, which you can call primary, or it can be primary cloud. And you have another data center, which you call replica, and you have a replication between uh, your databases. I, we're going to look deeper into details how this replication is going to work, but this is just a high level overview for uh, multi cloud for databases, how it usually uh, works. And um, uh, what would happen if we add Kubernetes uh, into this picture of a multi cloud? Because what we know about Kubernetes is that. Uh, it provides you with uh, no vendor lock-in by design because Kubernetes API is more or less standard. Yes, we would be completely honest. There are some Kubernetes flavors that uh, come with various building blocks, but in 90% or 95% cases, Kubernetes API, uh, APIs are usually the same. There are definitely some limitations, like you can compare EKS, uh, running on Amazon and uh, GKE running in Google Cloud, and you would see that there are different webhooks, for example, where um, the way it provisions the storage or the networking might be a bit different. But uh, in 95% uh, of the cases, it's the same API uh, across on prem, clouds, and various clouds. And uh, as long as it is uh, the same API, the same control plane, it's definitely easy to migrate. So if you have a pod in Kubernetes cluster A, then you can recreate the same pod in Kubernetes cluster B. It's just a matter of migrating the storage, the networking, uh, but all, all, all the Kubernetes primitives are the same. And uh, what also Kubernetes comes with is huge community and application libraries. What I mean by libraries is operators. So you can uh, have lots of applications running it and uh, you can replace lots of components in your clouds by uh, Kubernetes applications. For example, Amazon RDS can be replaced by Percona operators for MySQL or for Postgres. And uh, th that would already solve your event lock-in problem and migration problem. Good, so now we understand how Kubernetes helps us. Let's see how Percona operators can help you with uh, databases running in uh, multi-cloud. So as I mentioned before, there are three operators that we have for MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB. We're going to go through them one by one and briefly overview how we address a multi-cloud problem for each of them. Um, if we talk about MySQL, so uh, our MySQL operator deploys per Conex 3DB cluster, which provides you with uh, synchronous replication. Per Conex 3DB or uh, cluster or PXC is a clustering solution for MySQL. It uses per server for MySQL and Galera. So it provides you a synchronous replication. And the way we approach it, so you have two Kubernetes clusters, one in cloud A, another one in cloud B. In each Kubernetes cluster, you install the operator and you deploy Percona X to DB cluster in each of them. And what you do is you just set up an asynchronous replication between these two clusters. That's it. So now in cloud B, you have the same data that you have in cloud A. But your application still writes here in cloud A. So in case of disaster, you can easily switch your application to cloud B. Uh, or in case that you want to migrate or perform any maintenance, you can do this failover uh, gracefully. So it is, again, an asynchronous replication between two PXC clusters. And it, it is all controlled by the operators. So you need to configure two operators and you need to configure two clusters. Um, what it is important to know about it, that this functionality is available only for MySQL uh, 
for version 8 or version older than 8.22 because in 8.22 out of failover for asynchronous replication was introduced and we rely on this functionality. What it means is that in case of uh, one of the nodes either here, either on main side or on replica side fails, then the replication will automatically restart. You don't need to reconfigure it. Uh, anything and we leverage this functionality in uh, our operators and uh, another important aspect here is that uh, either main site or replica site can be a non-Kubernetes environment yes it's not going to be controlled by the operator but it's important to understand that uh, if you want to migrate from on-prem to Kubernetes for example uh, you can do it uh, uh, with the operator running in Kubernetes environment and with manually configuring uh, MongoDB somewhere uh, on or MySQL somewhere on prem. So it's a good for migrations. And uh, I, I just want to iterate that it's not valid only for MySQL, but for MongoDB and Postgres operators. So uh, we'll, we'll see it in, in the next slides. And this is a quick example of uh, how uh, main and replica side uh, are going to be configured with our uh, YAML manifest for our operators. So in here, you see that we create replication channel. We name it like this. We say that it is source, which means that's the main side. And on the replica side, we define the sources list. So we assume that this is some IP address uh, on the main side and we define the port we define the weight and that's it so you configure two operators you configure two clusters like that and you get your replication running and in case of disaster you can easily switch let's talk about mongodb what we do for mongodb as in uh, on a high level we expand the replica set so again we have cloud a we have cloud b we have two kubernetes clusters we have two operators running in each of the Kubernetes clusters. And uh, in cloud A, which is the main one, we have replica set, which is regularly deployed. And in cloud B, what we do is our operator uh, runs all these nodes as unmanaged. And what happens then we expand the replica set. So now it's a big replica set once we expanded it. Uh, so again, we're leveraging the standard MongoDB functionality. I'm going to show MongoDB uh, in the demo, so it would be easier to understand, but um, I think it should be easy enough. So on the main side, uh, we expose all the nodes. On the replica side, we expose all the nodes. And what we do here on the main side, we expand the replica set with the nodes that we have on the replica side. So we just define all the host votes priority here. And now instead of three nodes in this replica set, we have six because we add all the nodes that we have on the replica side or five, whatever you have. Now, if we talk about Postgres, for Postgres, um, it, it might surprise you a bit, but we decided not to use the replication method and we decided to use PG backrest. The reason is simple because it, it is easier and it already has this functionality. For Postgres operator, we have uh, PG backrest as the tool that we use for backups and uh, restores. And uh, when you set it up, uh, you upload full or incremental backups to some external bucket to S3 or GCS or Azure Blob Storage, whatever. And you also put the right ahead logs. And uh, what we do actually is again, we have two clusters here, one in Amsterdam, another one in London, for example. And uh, for uh, the one which is a main site, we just configure PG backrest so that it loads the full backups and right ahead logs to this external bucket. Probably you want to keep this external bucket either in London or in some other. Uh, in the third site, but it's not the topic here. And what we do on disaster recovery site, 
uh, we configure Pju backrest to pull all these uh, backups and write ahead logs and restore them continuously on our cluster running in disaster recovery side. So it's just backup here, restore here, and it's going continuously nonstop. So it's like similar to replication. And as long as we already have this functionality in PG backrest, we don't want to implement the replication mechanism uh, in our operator. It's easier for us to utilize PG backrest. And that's it. So, and again, if we look into the example of the YAML manifests on the main side, we say standby false. And on the replica side, we say standby true. And that's basically the only difference because uh, the backup configuration is similar. Primary and replicas configuration, it doesn't matter what you have. But this is the only flag that you need to be aware about. You set it to uh, true and you start syncing uh, the data from this uh, bucket to your cluster. And now you have two clusters which are in sync and you can easily fail over in case of uh, disaster. So what we looked at, we looked at MySQL where we use asynchronous replication. We looked at uh, MongoDB where we just expand the replica set and we looked into Postgres operator where we use PG backrest. Again, all these items are available uh, uh, in our operators already, and it's 100% open source. And uh, uh, we have customers who use it in prod a lot. So we encourage you to try it out. Um, before we go to the demo, I also want to look into this interesting example. Uh, this is multi-cluster services or MCS. If you ever worked with this, it's pretty interesting. It's uh, I would say it's like the next federation, federation V2 <laughs> or V3 already. Uh, what it does is for now it only expands, uh, allows you to expand the Kubernetes network uh, across multiple Kubernetes clusters. How it works is uh, uh, on one cluster, uh, so you, you connect two clusters into the single, what is called MCS domain. There is an MCS operator running in each of the clusters. And then this MCS uh, operators, they allow you to create specific objects in Kubernetes, which are called service imports and service exports. And uh, uh, once you create uh, a service export object on each of the clusters, you have service import object created. Uh, but uh, what you need to understand is that from every cluster in MCS domain, you can access uh, any other resource uh, through this SVC cluster set dot local domain. So instead of figuring out the public IP address of the cluster, you just connect your application to this service import object and it can be here, it can be here, it doesn't matter. And uh, the beauty of it that now you have two Kubernetes clusters and uh, you see them as a, as in a single networking domain. So it removes a lot of complexity for you. You don't need to think about load balancers. You don't need to think about any other IP addresses, cluster IP, whatever it is. You just use this SVC cluster set dot local. And, uh, I encourage you to try it out. Uh, it's a, I, I, it can be also used for multi-cloud. It just masquerades a lot of networking complexity for you. And for example, our MongoDB operator automates the creation of service imports uh, and service exports objects. So once you enable MCS, uh, our operator detects this and creates all these services. For other operators, there is no need for that, but uh, We'll think if we need to automate it as well. Anyhow, I encourage you to try it out. It's pretty interesting technology. Okay, let's go to the demo. Uh, as long as uh, I'm not very confident, <laughs> I'm going to have it pre-recorded. So I'm just going to comment what's happening here. What I have is I have one MongoDB node which is running somewhere, I guess it's digital ocean IP address. 
And uh, I have a replica set with one node only. It's just for demonstration purposes. And my goal is to migrate this MongoDB node to Kubernetes so that I have all the uh, data synchronized. And this is our uh, Percona server MongoDB or Percona operator for MongoDB YAML manifest. This is where you define the configuration uh, for your MongoDB cluster. You can see size here. You can see that I disabled sharding. You can see the version of MongoDB that, that I want to run and many, many, many more, right? And uh, you see, I, I, I said this unmanaged to true. This is the Kubernetes site. So I want my nodes to be unmanaged. I don't want operator to create a replica set. Uh, I want them to be fully unmanaged. I expose them through the load balancer in Kubernetes. Again, don't do this in production probably, Better to use something like MCS or some VPN network if you have it. Uh, okay, I already have uh, these nodes deployed so that we don't wait for it. Uh, let's see, I have, I have uh, load balancers already there. So I have this three public IP addresses. Each node has its own IP address. For MongoDB, it's extremely important that once you expand the replica set, that all the nodes can talk to each other. So they can form, they, they need to form a full mesh. If they don't form a full mesh, you're not going to be able to have a fully functioning replica set. So all the nodes must talk to each other. And uh, I have already created uh, some dummy domain name, which points to this uh, nodes. I'm using my domain, I guess. Uh, yeah, so I, I have kates one mongo as pron.in, and uh, there are kates 2 and so on and so on. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to look at the status again. You see I have one node on in the replica set. I'm going to add more nodes. I'm going to add node number one. I'm going to add node number two. So I'm adding Kubernetes nodes to my uh, replica set, which is running somewhere on digital, digital ocean, not in Kubernetes. So now I have all these nodes here added. You see they have secondary status, uh, secondary, secondary, and primary is still my digital ocean node, not Kubernetes one. I, I think Kubernetes is somewhere in Google Cloud, but it doesn't matter much. Kubernetes can be anywhere. Okay, what I need to do now is I just need to uh, switch primary from uh, DigitalOcean to Kubernetes. The way to do it is through MongoDB. Uh, I'm just going to change the priority one of the nodes. You, you cannot do it through the operator yet because uh, we want to manage the infrastructure, but we don't want to go deep into the MongoDB internals. Uh, what I'm setting now is for one of the nodes in Kubernetes cluster, I'm setting high priority, and uh, I'm ensuring that it can vote, and that's it. Uh, reconfig, reconfig, yeah. Okay, the configuration is done. What should happen now is that one of the nodes in Kubernetes cluster, it should become primary. And now my application, I need to switch my application to write to this node. If you do this kind of failover, you need to reconfigure the application probably, uh, but it's fine. Okay, yeah, you see my Kubernetes node, kates-1 is now primary. So that's it, the, the migration from on-prem to Kubernetes is done. Now I can kill this secondary node, which is running in DigitalOcean. I have the data synchronized and that's it. Uh, I, I, I'm officially multi-cloud, right? Obviously I don't have a lot of data there, so it's not production environment, but uh, what, what I need to do now is I'm going to tell the operator to take the lead. Now 
unmanaged is set to false, which means that operator is uh, going to manage uh, my new environment now so that I can kill this digital ocean node. And now I have a MongoDB cluster running in operator and managed by the operator. I'm going to show something else here. Let's see. Yeah, I'm just showing that primary status is here and this node is still in second where I can delete it now. So that's it. That's the demo. Uh, I showed you how to migrate MongoDB uh, from, from somewhere, let's say on-prem or other cloud to Kubernetes with Percona operator. Uh, these slides will be shared later. And there is a link actually to this demo, which is uh, recorded. So you would be able to see it again. Um, this is the last slide for today. The, there are some useful links that would help you to understand this multi-cloud story with uh, Percona operators. Uh, this is for MySQL operator. This is the documentation for this cross-site replication. We also have a blog post about migrating your MySQL database to Kubernetes with this feature. The same goes for Mongo, the doc, the blog for migration, and also there is a blog post about Kubernetes MCS. Uh, please give it a read, it's pretty good. Uh, and for Postgres, again, uh, the document on how to deploy a standby cluster for disaster recovery, but it can be also used for migration. And this is the blog post about migrating stuff and setting it up. So good. That's it for today. Really appreciate your time. I hope you enjoyed my talk and uh, I wish you a good day. Thank you, everyone.